altri paesi si stanno Bonjour et bienvenue à la Citadelle. Je m'appelle Nathalie Babin Dufresne Hello, et je suis and welcome to the Citadel. I am director of communications at Rideau Hall. I will be your master of ceremonies. It is an honor to be here with you today. Our official photographer will take photos that will be shared with you in the coming days. I would ask you not to take photo or video during the ceremony. Now, please ensure your phones are turned off. We understand that today can be a difficult day for some of you. Please note that we have mental health support workers ready to help guests who need it. Before beginning, I would like to introduce Mr. Alexander McKenzie from Metsimikush Shefferville, who will play the drum for the arrival of His Holiness and Her Excellency. Thank you, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the Citadel. My name is Nathalie Babin Dufresne. I'm Director of Communications at Rideau Hall, and I'll be your Masters of Ceremony. It's an honor to be here with you today. As our official photographer will be taking photos, which will be shared with you in the coming days, I would ask that you not take any photos or videos during the ceremony. At this time, I would also ask that you ensure that your cell phones are turned off. We understand that today might be difficult for some guests, and please note that we have some mental health support workers ready to assist guests in need of support. I would now like to introduce Alexandre McKenzie from Matsumekush Shefferville to play drum as we welcome His Holiness and Her Excellency. Thank you. I invite you to stand, if you can, to welcome His Holiness Pope Francis, their Excellencies, and the Prime Minister. I invite you to please rise, if you are able, and welcome His Holiness Pope Francis, their Excellencies, and the Prime Minister. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to welcome all, uh, everybody here, uh, the Prime Minister, Pope uh, Francis. I'd 
just like to ask everybody um, to remember our people uh, that have passed. Today I like to remember the children that has passed uh, that did not come home and I would like to pray for the survivors. Thank you. Please be seated. On behalf of their excellencies, Mary Simon and Whit Fraser, I'd like to welcome you to the ceremony. The Right Honorable Barry Simon and Mr. Whit Fraser, I welcome you to this ceremony. Just prior to the beginning of the ceremony, a traditional Inuit lamp known as the Kulik was lit to mark this important day. Traditionally, the Kulik was lit by Inuit women to bring warmth and light to their home. Today, we are grateful for Olipika Rebecca Vivi from Nunavut, who will tend the Kulik throughout the ceremony. We light the kulik, the traditional Inuit lamp, during important events like today's ceremony. This lamp is used in the north to bring light and warmth to the home. To begin, I'd like to invite an elder from the Huron-Wendat Nation, Raymond Grolouis of the Huron-Wendat First Nations, to offer words of welcome. We will remain seated. However, I'll ask you something special. You know, with the pandemic, a lot of things changed in our ceremonies, and we had no choice but to adapt. When I light the sweet grass, and make my link with the four directions. And when I bring the sweet grass to Pope Francis and a feather from a wild turkey, which is an element of survival for the Wendat on the land. So I will give him that sweet grass and the feather. Sweet grass purifies through the smell through the sense of smell. I know Pope Francis has a little bit of difficulty with smoke, so we have many ways of conducting a ceremony and to adapt. And I think it's important that Pope Francis receives this sweet grass and this feather to participate in the smudge to the four directions. I'll introduce myself in Wendat. Chiati on the shawen on the wee. Chiati a mongol wee. Chiati on a harisqua. One that and the one that came dali. Safepo lota que j'ai appris a riatu. I didn't relearn my language until recently. I don't know it all. But even being able to introduce myself counts for a lot. Because when I introduce myself in my language, I'm not just speaking on my behalf, but on behalf of my whole nation. So I will rise. We have something in common. You have your wheelchair, and I've got my walker. Pope Francis, here is a feather from a wild turkey. This is very important for our nation on the land. And here is the sweet grass. It smells very good, by the way. Yes, you can take it. You can take it with a feather.
Et on va faire un cercle virtuel. We'll do a virtual circle. You know, with the pandemic, we use video. And I noticed that even when we're not in person, we can do things in spirit. And we'll open a circle here today in spirit. And from that circle, we can visualize a sacred fire. Because sacred fire unites everything that exists in creation. So we'll put virtual tobacco in that fire as well. And we will honor earth, wind, water, and fire. We will honor the mineral aspect, the vegetable aspect, and the human aspect. I will ask the east direction to open its door so we can have access to that direction. I will ask the southern direction to open its door as well to have, to have access to that direction. I will ask the western direction to open that door, the grandmother door. We'll honor the northern direction, the direction of grandfathers. And then also it's special for the Inuit because there are, they are a minority within a minority. It's easy to forget them, but it's important to think of them. And I'm pleased that she began with the Kulik, which I am also familiar with. So it's an honor to have the Inuit culture here as well. I'll open the four directions. I will whistle four times. This is a wild turkey bone I've had for about 20 years, and I use it in my ceremonies. Before I do that, I'd like for you to put your hands on your heart each one of you. The heart can be like a talking stick, but that's where the Creator put wisdom in humans. And we often need to remind ourselves of this. It's an important gesture to connect ourselves with that wisdom. I ask the Western grandmother to give us access to the sacred circle of spirits so they can be with us, so we can be united and stronger together. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. I'd like to now invite the Right Honorable Justin Trudeau to say a few words. Dear elders, Raymond, Vivi, indigenous leaders, most Holy Father, Excellencies, Premier Legault, I'm very pleased to be with you here today and to be able to say a few opening words. I would like to begin by thanking the First Nations who have occupied this territory for millennia for welcoming us to their traditional and treaty lands. As we welcome His Holiness this week, it's important to reflect on the significance of this moment for survivors, for Indigenous peoples, and indeed for all Canadians. Hier, 
Yesterday, July 26th, was the Feast of St. Anne. St. Anne is an important figure for Catholics. She represents maternal love, and she also represents family. Family is our roots. It is what helps us to grow and to discover the world. And family is the first thing that was taken away from the children who were sent to residential schools. When I visited to Kamloops, Kawases, and Williams Lake, when I talk with survivors and with families, I think of the children and I think of the parents too. I can't imagine my kids being taken away. When my kids are crying, I can console them. When they're happy, I can share that feeling of joy with them, of accomplishment. But in residential schools, these children were alone and isolated in their pain and sorrow, far from their families and communities, and even worse, stripped of their language, their culture, their identity. In solitude profound. Deep solitude, loss of family and community, and also of their language, their culture, and their identity. Since the 2015 release of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report, the First Nations, the Inuit, and the Mitzi have been calling on the Pope to apologize to survivors, to their families, and to communities, to apologize for the role that the Roman Catholic Church as an institution played in the abuse the spiritual abuse, cultural abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, and sexual abuse of indigenous children in church-run residential schools. This week's event at Musquachis would not have been possible without the courage and perseverance of the survivors who shared their painful memories and experiences, including directly with the Holy Father himself. Your Holiness, in our previous conversations from the first time we spoke about this, you always offered your time, genuinely seeking to understand, to do right, and to atone. This week, you recognized the abuses experienced at residential schools that resulted in cultural destruction, loss of life, and ongoing traumas lived by Indigenous peoples in every region of the country. As Your Holiness has said, begging pardon is not the end of the matter. It is a starting point, a first step. On Monday morning, I was sitting with survivors, and I felt their reaction to your apology. Each will take from it what they need, but there's no doubt that you had an enormous impact. Survivors and their descendants need to be at the center of everything we do going forward. In April, Dene National Chief Gerald Antoine was at the Vatican, and he compared the moment to the experience of walking through the snow and seeing fresh moose tracks. It was a feeling of hope. Today, I want to say, let's all continue our work together to keep this hope alive. When I went to the Vatican five years ago now, I was there to discuss residential schools and reconciliation with Your Holiness. And I know that your presence here this week would not have been possible without your personal convictions and your integrity. Thank you for coming with an open heart. We all recognize that the residential school system attempted to assimilate Indigenous children. Today, Indigenous peoples continue to fight to defend and preserve their cultures and languages. The traditional gathering that took place in Musquachis is a very good example. 
La réconciliation Reconciliation is the responsibility of us all. It is our responsibility to see our differences not as a barrier, but as an opportunity to learn, to better understand each other, and to take action. Our Governor General talks often about how reconciliation is not a single act, but a lifetime journey of healing. This journey is different for everyone. I spoke about Saint Anne being a symbol of maternal love and family, but Saint Anne is also a symbol of healing. Tomorrow, Your Holiness will visit Saint Anne de Beaupré. Pilgrims have been traveling there for centuries to pray and to ask Saint Anne to help them heal. So, in the spirit of healing, let us never give up. Canadians, institutions, let us continue our work together with Indigenous peoples until we reach a better future for everyone. Merci. Thank you. Gracias. Tiawek. Merci, Monsieur le Premier ministre. Thank you, Prime Minister. I invite Her Excellency, the Right Honourable Mary Simon, Governor General of Canada, to take the floor. I would now ask the Governor General, Her Excellency, the Right Honourable Mary Simon, to offer her address. Bonjour. Hello. Hello and good afternoon. Unusakut Kwe. Votre Santate Javu. Welcome, Your Holiness, to the Citadel. Welcome, Your Holiness, to the Citadel of Quebec. My husband, Wit, and I are honored to welcome you and to be joined by survivors, elders, leaders, knowledge keepers, diplomats, dignitaries, former commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and all of those watching from coast to coast to coast. I want to thank the First Nations who have occupied this territory for millennia for welcoming me to their traditional and treaty lands. Po import. Regardless of where you are listening from, either here at the Citadel or elsewhere in Canada, you are on Indigenous land. It is important to acknowledge this. Your Holiness, thank you for making this visit to Canada on what you have called your pilgrimage of penance. We gather at this historic Citadel where stories are shared and ideas are exchanged. With this visit, you're signaling to the world that you and the Roman Catholic Church are joining us on our path of reconciliation, healing, hope, and renewal. It began in Masquatrit, where we witnessed two realities. The first was the hurt and pain of survivors, communities of people who suffered for decades Indigenous peoples forced to live with policies meant to strip away their cultures, languages, and spiritual beliefs and practices. Survivors who every day carry the trauma of their residential school experience. But these people, these survivors, they defy definition. They are parents who defended their children when no one else would. They are advocates who fought and are still fighting for their languages and cultures so that they can thrive for generations to come. They are artists who are channeling their stories through their music, dance, cultures, and language. They are all proud. They are all strong. Your Holiness, 
They came to hear what you had to say with hearts and minds open, some willing to forgive, some still living with the hurt, but all willing to listen, everyone hoping to further their healing journey. Indigenous peoples showed the world and continue to show us that despite the challenges they may face, they will face them with dignity and great resolve. I acknowledge and applaud what has been achieved, what indigenous communities have achieved with this week's visit. It is indigenous peoples who worked, waited and prayed for an apology on indigenous lands in Canada. They never gave up. We must remember that it is because of their courage and resilience that we are here today. Your Holiness, their efforts make Canada a stronger nation. Sapili lauk si mangi mata ilinya reakti tau hatta si maju bini taman na ani nak si maju atuk tau si maninga tu kisi jauh tiga suak sugu. It si rak jua rapik how you mana kotit nuna hak si maju it Canada mek nuki hak ti si mata. It is our collective duty to remember what happened at residential schools, to tell the stories of survivors and of those who never made it home, and to support and care for those who did. Support in terms of mental health resources, helping families discover the true fate of those who never made it home, and care for Indigenous peoples who need the time and space to process what this visit means to them and what the next step sh should be. As you indicated, Your Holiness, this is an important step towards further dialogue and actions that will lead to real reconciliation. Indeed, we look forward to hearing more of the Church's future actions to continue this essential work. On Monday, you visited the Sacred Heart Church of the First Peoples in Edmonton. There, you said that reconciliation is a grace that must be sought. To that, I would also add that reconciliation is a grace that must be earned through continuous hard work and understanding. That work falls to each and every one of us, our sacred responsibility. There is a time for everything. We are ready. In Canada, there has been a monumental shift in our thinking. Now is the time in our country's history and consciousness for reconciliation. As we address this issue and the future health and well-being of Indigenous communities, I put my faith in each of us to encourage healing. In Inuktitut, to heal, Mamisangnuk. Mamisangnuk is a journey. Mamisangnuk is a healing form, a form of healing. Slowly, softly, and carefully. It follows its own path, carrying us forward, but also in many other directions. In Inuktitut, to heal is Mamisangnuk. Mami Sagnik is a journey, not a destination. This um, Mami Sagnik means healing, um, to walk towards healing Hopefully. for everyone to be involved and to walk together towards healing and towards reconciliation. Also in many other directions. Eventually, healing takes us beyond powerlessness or anger or pain. It takes us beyond trauma. It's renew it renews our mental, spiritual, and physical health. I've seen this in action. 
I've seen healing through art, through community, through kindness, through generosity, through the revitalization of language, culture, and identity. Your Holiness, long after you leave Canada, I know you will continue listening and learning, not only about the struggles and pains of these communities, but also about the pride they feel to be Indigenous, their resilience, and how they contribute to Canada and the world. Take these stories back with you, share them widely, and continue to find ways to work together to extend a hand to heal our communities. I have great hope in what I have seen so far during this visit. Canada looks forward to working with the Holy See on reconciliation, as well as many other pressing global issues such as promoting peace and education, breaking down barriers, fighting poverty and disease, and rebuilding trust. Thank you for your efforts. And thank you to all Canadians for hearing and responding to the call for reconciliation. Merci à tous Thank you les to all Canadians for hearing and responding to the call for reconciliation. I want to thank all Canadians for listening and for hearing our effort, our, co our call to work together, to come together, to unite in this very important cause. May the Creator bless us all. Merci. Thank you, Excellency. I would now invite His Holiness Pope Francis to share his address. I would now invite His Holiness Pope Francis to give his speech. Madam Governor General, Mr. Prime Minister, distinguished civil and, re and religious authorities, dear representatives of the indigenous peoples, honorable members of the diplomatic corps, ladies and gentlemen, I cordially greet you and I thank Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Mary Simon and His Excellency Justin Trudeau for their kind words. I am happy to be able to address you who have the responsibility of serving the people of this great country that, from sea to sea, displays an extraordinary natural heritage. Among its many beauties, I think of the immense and spectacular maple forests that make the Canadian countryside uniquely colorful and variegated. I would like to take as my starting point the symbol par excellence of these lands, the maple leaf, which, starting with the seal of Quebec, rapidly spread to become the emblem that appears on the national flag. That development took place in relatively recent times, but the maple trees preserve the memory of many past generations, going back well before the colonists arrived on Canadian soil. The native peoples extracted maple sap with which they concocted wholesome and healthy syrups. This makes us think of their industriousness and their constant concern to protect the land and the environment in keeping with a harmonious vision of creation as an open book that teaches human beings to love the Creator and to live in symbiosis with other living creatures. We can learn much from this ability to listen attentively to God, to persons, and to nature. 
and we need it. Especially amid the dizzying and frenzied pace of today's world, marked by a constant rapidification which makes difficult a truly human, sustainable, and integral development, and ends up creating a society of weariness and disillusionment, a society that finds it hard to recover the taste for con contemplation, authentic relationships, and the mystique of togetherness. We have such a need to listen to each other and to dialogue with one another in order to step back from the prevailing individualism, from hasty judgments, widespread aggressiveness, and the temptation to v divide the world into good people and bad. The large maple leaves which absorb polluted air and in turn give out oxygen invite us to marvel at the beauty of creation and to appreciate the wholesome values present in the indigenous cultures. They can inspire us all and help to heal harmful tendencies to exploit, to exploit not only creation, but also time and relationships, and to base human activity solely on what proves useful and profitable. These vital teachings, however, were violently opposed in the past. I think, above all, of the policies of assimilation and enfranchisement, which also involved the residential school system and which harmed many indigenous families by undermining their language, their culture, and their worldview. In that deplorable system promoted by the government authorities of the time, which separated so many children from their families, different local Catholic institutions played a part. For this reason, I express my deep shame and sorrow, and together with the bishops of this country, I renew my request for forgiveness for the wrong done by so many Christians to the indigenous peoples. I beg forgiveness. It is tragic when some believers, as happened in that period of history, conform themselves to the conventions of the world rather than to the gospel. The Christian faith has played an essential role in shaping the highest ideals of Canada, characterized by the desire to build a better country for all of its people. But at the same time, it is necessary, in admitting our faults, to work together to accomplish a goal that I know all of you share, to promote the legitimate rights of the native populations and to favor processes of healing and reconciliation between them and the non-Indigenous people in the country. This is reflected in the commitment to respond in a fitting way to the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It is also reflected in your concern to acknowledge the rights of Native peoples. The Holy See and the local Catholic communities are concretely committed to promoting indigenous cultures in specific and appropriate spiritual ways that include attention to their cultural traditions, customs, languages, and educational processes in the spirit of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It is our desire to renew the relationship between the Church and the Indigenous Peoples of Canada, a relationship marked both by a love that has borne outstanding fruit and, tragically, deep wounds that we are committed to understanding and healing. I am truly grateful to have encountered and listened to various representatives of the Indigenous peoples in recent months in Rome, and to be able, here in Canada, to renew the good relations established there. 
the time we spent together made an impression on me. They left me with a firm desire to respond to the indignation and shame for the suffering endured by the indigenous peoples and to move forward on a fraternal and patient journey with all Canadians in accordance with truth and justice, working toward healing and reconciliation and constantly inspired by hope. That history of suffering and contempt the fruit of the colonizing mentality does not heal easily. Indeed, it should make us realize that colonization has not ended. In many places, it has been transformed, disguised, and concealed. This is the case with forms of ideological colonization. In the past, the colonialist mentality disregarded the concrete life of people and imposed certain predetermined cultural models. Yet today, too, there are a number of forms of ideological colonization that clash with the reality of life, stifle the natural attachment of peoples to their values, and attempt to uproot their traditions, history, and religious ties. This mentality presumptuously thinking that the dark pages of history have been left behind, becomes open to what is called cancel culture that would judge the past purely on the basis of certain contemporary categories. The result is a cultural fashion that levels everything out, makes everything equal, proves intolerant of differences, and concentrates on the present moment, on the needs and rights of individuals, while frequently neglecting their duties with regard to the most weak and vulnerable of our brothers and sisters, the poor, migrants, the elderly, the sick, the unborn. They are the forgotten ones in affluent societies. They are the ones who, amid general indifference, are cast aside like dry leaves to be burnt. Instead, the rich, multicolored foliage of the maple tree reminds us of the importance of the whole, the importance of developing human communities that are not blandly uniform, but truly open and inclusive. And just as every leaf is fundamental for the luxuriant foliage of the branches, so each family, as the essential cell of society, is to be given its due because the future of humanity passes through the family. The family is the first concrete social reality, yet it is threatened by many factors. Domestic violence, the frenetic pace of labor, an individualistic mindset, cutthroat careerism, unemployment, the loneliness and isolation of young people, the abandonment of the elderly and the infirm. The indigenous peoples have much to teach us about the care and protection of the family. Among them, for an, from an early age, children learn to recognize right from wrong, to be truthful, to share, to correct mistakes, to begin anew, to com comfort one another, and to be reconciled. May the wrongs that were endured by the indigenous peoples that we are ashamed of today serve as a warning to us, lest concern for the family and its rights be neglected for the sake of greater productivity and individual interests. Let us return to the maple leaf. In wartime, soldiers used those leaves for bandages and to soothe wounds. Today, before the senseless folly of war, there is once again a need to heal from forms of hostility and extremism and to cure the wounds of hatred. 
a witness of tragic acts of violence in the past, recently observed that peace has its own secret, which is never to hate anyone. If we want to live, we must never hate. There is no need to divide the world into friends and enemies, to create distances, an arms race and strategies of deterrence will not bring peace and security. We need to ask ourselves not how to pursue wars, but how to stop them and to prevent entire peoples from once more being held hostage in the grip of terrible and protracted cold wars. What we need are creative and far-sighted policies capable of moving beyond the categories of opposition in order to provide answers to global challenges. In fact, the great challenges of our day, like peace, climate change, the effects of the pandemic and international migration movements, all have one thing in common. They are global. They are global challenges. They concern everyone. And since all of them speak of the need to consider the whole, politics cannot remain confined to partisan interests. We must be able to look, as Indigenous wisdom tradition teaches, seven generations ahead, and not to our immediate convenience, to the next election, or the support of this or that lobby group. But we need also to appreciate the yearning of young people for fraternity, justice, and peace. In order to preserve memory and wisdom, we need to listen to the elderly. But in order to press forward towards the future, we also need to embrace the dreams of young people. They deserve a better future than the one we are preparing for them. They deserve to be involved in decisions about the building of the world of today and tomorrow, particularly about the protection of our common home. In this regard, the values and teachings of the Indigenous peoples are precious. Here, I would like to express appreciation for the praiseworthy commitment being made at the local level to protecting the environment. It could even be said that the symbols drawn from nature, such as the fleur de lys in the flag of this province of Quebec and the maple leaf in the country's flag, confirm Canada's ecological vocation. When the Commission for the Creation of the Canadian Flag set about evaluating the thousands of sketches submitted for that purpose, many of them presented by ordinary people, it proved surprising that almost all of them contained the image of the maple leaf. The convergence around this shared symbol leads me to bring up an essential word for all Canadians. Multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is fundamental for the cohesiveness of a society as diverse as the dappled colors of the foliage of the maple trees. With its multiple points and sides, the maple leaf reminds us of a polyhedron. It tells us that you are people capable of inclusion, such that new arrivals can find a place in that multiform unity and make their own original contribution to it. Multiculturalism is a permanent challenge. It involves accepting and embracing all the different elements present, while at the same time respecting their diverse traditions and cultures, and never thinking that the process is complete. In this regard, I express my appreciation for the generosity shown in accepting many Ukrainian and Afghan migrants. Yet there is also a need to move beyond the rhetoric of fear with regard to immigrants and to give them, according to the country's possibilities, the concrete opportunity to become involved responsibly in society. For this to happen, rights and democracy are indispensable. But it is also necessary to confront the individualistic mindset 
and to remember that life in common is based on presuppositions that the political system cannot produce on its own. Here, too, indigenous culture is of great help in recalling the importance of social values. The Catholic Church, with its universal dimension, its concern for the most vulnerable, its rightful service to human life at every moment of its existence, from conception to natural death, is happy to offer its specific contribution. In these days, I have heard about the many needy people who come knocking on the doors of parishes. Even in a country as developed and prosperous as Canada, which pays great attention to social assistance, there are many homeless people who turn to churches and food banks to receive essential help in meeting their needs, which, lest we forget, are not only material. These brothers and sisters of ours spur us to reflect on the urgent need for efforts to remedy the radical injustice that taints our world, because of which the abundant gifts of creation are unequally distributed. It is scandalous that the well-being generated by economic development does not benefit all sectors of society. And it is sad, it is sad that precisely among native peoples we often find high rates of poverty along with other negative indicators such as a low percentage of schooling and less than easy access to housing and to health care. May the emblem of the maple leaf, which regularly appears on the labels of this country's products, serve as an incentive to everyone to make economic and social decisions that foster participation and care for those in need. It is by working in common accord, hand in hand, that today's pressing challenge must be faced. I thank you for your hospitality, your attention, your respect, and with sincere affection, I assure you that Canada and its people are truly close to my heart. Thank you. On behalf of their excellencies, I would like to thank you all for your presence here today. And to close this ceremony, the Métis violinist Alicia and Liam Bloor, brother and sister from Toronto, will accompany the departure of the official delegation. Thank you for attending today's gathering. As the official party departs, they will be accompanied by Métis fiddling duo Alicia and Liam Bloor, siblings from Toronto. Thank you. Merci. Nakurmik.